I hope you've had a good week, everyone. In spite of the problems, in spite of the difficulties, we've got much to be thankful for. And that's what we've got to concentrate on. It's so important. We live in a negative world, and it's going to get a lot worse, I'm afraid. Uh, we can always try to be optimistic, all of us. We hope for better because, like they say, hope is eternal. You know, it's, it's what everybody hopes, things will get better. But somewhere down the line, things are not going to get better, according to the Word of God. And we have to prepare for that. Because if we don't, we'll be living in a false sense of reality. We'll say, well, you know, it's always been this way. We've had bad things, and we got over it, and we came out of the Depression, and what have you, and now we had the good times, and yeah, we're having a time now, but it'll get better. Well, we hope and pray that's the case. But from the Word of God, we get something quite different pictured as far as what's really going to happen if certain things begin to fall in place. Now, Jesus told his disciples, because they asked him a question that all of us ask, and every generation has probably asked this very same thing. Uh, what is the sign of your coming, and what will be the end of the age? Uh, Paul thought it was in the end of the age, you know, when he talked about uh, some of the things happening in his lifetime. He says, well, Christ is going to come, and we know this. And all of a sudden he realized, well, no, that's not going to work out. So what God has done, he's always allowed every generation to have the idea and the sense of urgency that God might come in your time. And there would be events and things that would seem to indicate that. But not really defined in specifics. Until you hit a period of time, Jesus said, and this will be one of the key things. He says, these things that will start to happen will be compared to a woman in her travail. In other words, she's going to go through a birth pangs, and the world is going to go through the first trimester, and then it will go through the second trimester, and then the third trimester is when it's getting close, when the baby's about to be born. And how does the woman know? Oh, you ladies know. You've been there, done that, and it's, it's, it's not... Uh, it's not all cotton candy, I'll tell you. It's, uh, you're going through it, and as far as us guys, our hat's off to you, ladies, because you really carry a heavy responsibility bringing new life into the world. And it is a great honor. That's why God gave woman that honor and that privilege, because she would be the vehicle whereby the Christ would come to us, our Savior, and provide salvation for us in a way that would never be possible without the male and the female relationship. Now that is a great blessing from God. You see, when you see things happen that begin to break down that relationship, such as in the 1960s, God was dead. He was declared dead on Time Magazine. I've got the cover. I think I've shown it to you in the past. I'll show it to you again sometime. I kept it for posterity's sake. I said, who in the world do they think they are? Well, we're still here. This is not in the 60s anymore. So is God dead? Well, from that time on, what happened? We have seen we have to have what? Separation from church and state. Sounds good. But things begin to develop in the world in a secular way rather than with a awareness of godly principles that founded our nation back in its early days. And so we saw what? Prayer being taken out of schools. And then we saw certain things like abortion. Oh, now made legal? And now, what was the next and final one? Now it's LGBTQT and any other one you want to put on there because it seems like it's Pandora's box is open and it's going in all directions. What does that do? It slaps God right in the face. It says, God, I know you made male and female, but we don't want it that way. We think it's better to go a different way. So when that happens, then God does what? He sees that people are not going to turn to him and repent. And so what you sow is what you reap, according to the word of God. And now in the third trimester, we are beginning to see things begin to really heat up. 
you and I have witnessed things moving in a direction like we've never seen before. People are hoping and praying, let's get back to normal, let's get back to where we can be like we used to be. Sorry folks, it's like a third trimester. <laughs> the, the woman with the child, she can't say, can it be like it was the first trimester? <laughs> it was a lot easier back then. No, it's not going back because something's got to be delivered. And what's got to be delivered is mankind. You and I are in one of the most dangerous periods of time in human history. You and I need to know that, we need to understand that, and we need to embrace that. And we also need to help our sons and daughters realize what they are going to have to face in the years ahead. God doesn't want anybody to be left in the dark. He warns everybody in the Word of God before he does anything. And he says, when you see these signs, that's what he told his disciples, and you and I are his end-time disciples in the 21st century. And what did he tell them to watch for? Well, when you see wars and rumors of wars, false prophets, sickness and disease and death and all these different things kind of beginning to escalate, earthquakes in different places, famines. Well, dear brethren, it's happening. It's all over the world, not just in the United States the Israelite countries of the world, of the Western world, but it's happening everywhere. Because why? People are not living the way God intended. And it's coming home to roost. You sow certain things, you reap certain things. And the Bible makes it very clear that we have to be extremely alert to what is happening now in our day and age because it is different than any other period of time. There's never been a trimester in past events. So, oh, there's been these things around, yes. Bad times in human history, yes. But nothing like this time. When have you ever seen in history a whole world shut down because of COVID-19? But it's happened. Who would have thought that could have suddenly caused individuals to lose their jobs? How, uh, suddenly everybody to have to behave in certain ways that are locking us down, almost like we can't function anymore. And we're so used to in America having this wonderful gift of freedom, the freedom of the West, freedom to come and go, because why? We had the Constitution of the United States that God provided by these men who were very, boy, they were something else back then. They, they, they read, they understood the world condition, they understood human nature, and what did they do? They provided a check and balance situation, at least so that we could function. Even if we hit bad pockets, we could get rid of those bad pockets and overcome it and go on. The only problem is, a new, new pharaoh has arisen on the land, and that pharaoh is the god of this world. He's making a comeback as never before. Why? Because God is now taking away the hedge of protection. And we hear these voices beginning to cry out and saying, well, you know, uh, our values are such, but they never define their values. But what their values basically are is they want to do away with the Constitution. They don't call it a fixed arrangement. They call it a constant moving or changing type of Constitution. That's what they want. Well, what does that set the stage for? It sets the stage for what we're seeing now today. And we're going to talk about something that I don't know if any of us have ever thought of it this way. But have you ever pondered or wondered in your mind as you read the book of Revelation, which, remember, is a book of prophecy? You and I are supposed to be reading that book right now. He said the time is at hand. And the warning is to the churches. You get those first three chapters in there, and it's all to the churches. They were all in Asia at the same time. The people of God are all around in the end time around the world. They're here, there, wherever God is working in the life of those individuals, that's where the people of God are located. That's why God is going to send his angels to the four corners of the world. They're not in one place. They're everywhere where God is working in the lives of men and women who fear him and keep his commandments. Well, here's the interesting part of it. By the time you get to the end of Revelation chapter 21, 
and verse 8, you will notice something. Let's take a quick look at that, if you would, please. In Revelation chapter 21 and verse 8. Revelation 21 and verse 8. Verse 7 talks about overcoming, and if we have been blessed to overcome with the help of God, we will inherit all things. I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But, but what? This is a big but that we need to take note of. And so he's saying, but the fearful. Notice that, the fearful. That's in the King James. Your other translations, like the no, uh, it's the New American Standard Version. They call it cowardice, cowardice or timid. So what we have here, he's saying, but the fearful, the unbelieving, then he lumps it in with the abominable murderers, whoremongers, sorcerers, idolaters, all liars. All will have their part, which burns in the lake of fire, the second death. You mean somebody could end up in the second death just because they're fearful? Yeah, because God has told us what? Fear not. Fear not because you have contact with the Almighty. When you're not in contact with the Almighty, you've got a lot of reasons to fear. And we're living in a world filled with fear. Being afraid is such a common thing among human beings. We all do. We all get fearful at times. It'd be nice if we didn't, but fear is a blessing in many ways. Because, you know, you don't want to step in front of a car. Why? Because the fear of you're going to get killed. And you don't want to do dumb, stupid things because, again, you, you fear the consequences. You could get hurt. So in this particular case, we have a situation where, while it seems very common, it's interesting that it is the very first thing that God says will put people in the lake of fire. That was phenomenal to me. I don't know how, how you read the Bible. Maybe you just read right over it. But everybody gets fearful. Have you ever been fearful? I've been fearful. You've been fearful. I don't want that kind of fear in my life, and you shouldn't want it in your life, because why? It'd make you a candidate for the lake of fire, God said. Wow. You read it like that, and you begin to say, whew. You got my attention. And what, am I, what do I need to know and understand about this thing of fear? Well, here's what we're going to do today. We're told in Revelation 12 and verse 9 that there is this individual called Satan the devil. And to summarize it, he has deceived the whole world. The whole world. I ask myself, you should ask yourself, how in the world does he do that? How is he able to pull this thing off in such a way that he's able to fool everybody, deceive them? It's like having, again, if you handed me a $20 bill and it was a counterfeit, you knew it was, but I didn't. Guess what? You wouldn't be deceived, but I would. I'd be deceived because I think I got a genuine 20, but you just handed me a counterfeit 20. And so you're not deceived, but I am. How is the whole world deceived? They don't understand. They think they've got the legitimate article and it has been sabotaged. How has it been sabotaged? By the God of this world. 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 11, the Apostle Paul made this statement. He says it's very important, he says, that we be not ignorant of Satan's devices. Satan has devices? Oh, you better believe it. He's got an arsenal of stuff. This angel, he, does, he doesn't come in a red suit with horns and a pitchfork and all that stuff. He's a glorious angel. He is called an angel of light. What is wrong with Lucifer, who became Satan the devil? It was not what's, what you see on the outside. God tells you that in the book of Ezekiel. He says, you were perfect in your ways until iniquity was found in you, not on you, in you. It's what you had hidden in your heart, inside. People see just the outside. They don't see what's coming from the inside. God sees the inside as well as the outside. He spotted what nobody else could see in Lucifer, 
and that was iniquity. He was harvesting iniquity in his heart and holding that, and as a result, he's got all kinds of weapons now that he has used because he takes the talents and abilities God gave him and he turned it around and he's using them against God and against the people of God and the purpose of God. So you and I now need to really pay attention. When God speaks, he's not kidding. He says, you better pay attention and you better fear me because you've been fearing the wrong God. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, one of the weapons that the adversary uses is what the, it's, it's a weapon of fear. The Bible shows us that through many examples. I have entitled this message today with this intent behind it. Satan's secret weapon, the weaponizing of fear. Satan's secret weapon, the weaponizing of fear. Why is it secret? Because people can't recognize it. It's, it's stealth. It slips into your life and you suddenly find yourself being caught off guard. But we're told by Paul, you're not to be ignorant of Satan's devices. Being afraid, as I mentioned earlier, is just a common thing. And you would normally tend to think, well, that's of minor concern. But when you read it in Revelation 21, you realize if that's right up front for personal on the first issue there of what's going to happen to those who end up in a lake of fire, then there must be something there we need to examine. If we look back in the aspect of this fear that Satan generates, what he does by creating fear and anxiety and upheaval in our life, it can cause us to do the wrong thing and it leads to sin and the violation of God's law. That's, what's go that's the goal of Satan. That's what he wants to do. It makes us do something wrong and then he knows that we have to be punished because we've done something wrong. That's why God says, what? Obey my voice. Don't walk contrary to me. But our whole nation today is walking contrary for the most part as far as the leadership taking us in a wrong direction. The people don't want this. They just want to be left alone and live life and enjoy the gift of life God intended. That's what God wanted. But sin has corrupted all that. And you and I are suffering the verdict of this in our lifetime. We have the example of Saul. Saul. What was Saul's problem? He was the first king of ancient Israel. And all this is written again, Romans 15, 4, for our learning. So we have this account of Saul. Why does God show us? And what, what does he want us to learn from that? Since you and I are going to be kings and priests by the grace of God in the kingdom of God, then we better understand what a king is supposed to do and what a king is not supposed to do. And stay away from any pro problem that could cause difficulty. Well, in 1 Samuel 15, verse 24, Saul's infamous sin that cost him his kingship and that cost him his life was his fear. And what was his fear? Well, his fear was that, uh, you know, the people. He feared the people. And so he, he did a presumptuous thing and he took it on himself instead of following and waiting for Samuel as he was instructed to do. People make rash choices when they're afraid. I don't know about you. If you've made mistakes in your life and you look back on it, were you driven by fear that caused you to do some of those things? The answer is, oh yes. We're all guilty of that. It slips up on us in ways that we don't understand because we're ignorant of Satan's devices. Thus, fear becomes a trap. And that's what we're told in Proverbs 29, verse 25. Proverbs 29, verse 25. And it says, the trap is the fear of man. You know, that's what human beings worry about. They don't worry about the animals out there. They worry about their fellow human beings. That's what they fear. Because if everybody was nice, they'd be great. But everybody's not nice. we got some pretty ugly and some evil and mean people out there. And God calls them the dross of humanity. They're not ones who want to walk in his ways. They want to walk in the enemy's ways. So the fear becomes a trap. Have you ever been trapped by fear? Well, I don't want to do that. What about today? Look at people. There are things happening you hear on the news 
where people uh, are afraid to say anything. Why? They might lose their job. They're afraid to speak out. Why? Persecution. So people are fearful, and rightly so. And some people right now are very fearful on the southern borders. Their cities are being overrun. But the leadership of our country is not doing anything. Why? God prophesied it. We're moving into the third trimester. You're going to see problems and difficulties like you've never seen before. If it does turn around somehow by the grace of God, because God is so merciful and he has, he has come time and time again and delayed things purposely. And the Bible talks about that, you know. He says there's going to come a time when certain things are going to be and he might extend the time and then other times he may cut it short. We just don't know some of those things. We have to put our faith and trust in God that he knows. That's all that matters. Not you and me. You and me, as far as what we know, is to help us better be a better person and be the person God wants us to be. People think they have to do something instead of waiting on God. It says, blessed are those that wait on the eternal. But people don't wait. People get impatient. Things have happened in the lives of many individuals that way. You read back there in the book of Nehemiah, chapter 4, and verse 7 through 14. I'm just re referencing these things to give you things to look at at your own recognizance. It's there, all of it. And when you read that story, you'll see a guy named Sam Ballot and what he wanted to do. He wanted Nehemiah to stop building the wall, repairing the wall. And so he was trying to strike fear into the heart that they were going to be attacked. And so you read that account and you learn that there are tactics that Satan uses. Fear can also be very intimidating of others. Any of us, as we say, people come up to you and they're in your face, that's intimidating. Nobody likes to have somebody just suddenly put themselves up in your face. Back away, you know, hey, give me some space here. But what we see is that there are people who do what? They will do things to force compliance. And today we're seeing that if you don't do certain things, you can't fly on an airplane. We're seeing forced compliance in certain areas of life. Things are changing. We're told in Ezekiel chapter 2 and verse 6, do not fear. That's what God is telling Ezekiel, his servant. He says, no matter how hard life becomes, don't get all anxious and upset over their harsh words and their mean looks. You know, people can get pretty nasty with the things they say, and we seem to be having a lot of nasty words flying today. And also, what do they, they can have what we call hard looks. That's when they've got these furrowed brows and they're just looking at you. If they're, as the old saying, if looks could kill, boom, you'd be dead because they have such ugly looks on their face. They're not friendly. So God was telling Ezekiel, look, Forget it. Just do it anyway. Tell them what needs to be told. Don't allow yourself to be intimidated. Jesus told his own disciples in Matthew chapter 10, verse 24 through 31. He told his disciples, let your fear be in God and not in man. Why? Because he says, fear him who can destroy both body and soul in Gehenna. Man can't do that. But God can. And if your fear is not with God, he can do that. He can do anything he wants, for he is God. But we are intimidated by man. We live in a world today where people scare other individuals. And we are told, 1 Peter 3 and verse 4, chapter 3 and verse 14, do not fear the intimidation. That's not constantly the admonition of Scripture is do not fear. Always when people Jesus would meet people, he'd say, you know, fear not. If angels came forth to tell Daniel something in a vision, he said, fear not, Daniel. Fear not. There's nothing to fear with God. But there's everything to fear with regard to the enemy. If we allow the enemy any room, we're in trouble. In Proverbs 28, verse 1, what God reveals here is that those who live a wicked lifestyle, they don't want to live according to God's commandments. Isn't it amazing? What do we call God's commandments that are supposed to be written in our mind and in our heart? 
We call it the law of God. God is a law-abiding being. And everyone that functions in his family or kingdom must be law-abiding. His law is supreme. What do we see today? We see attacks against law enforcement officers. Defund the police. Why would they want to do that when they're there to protect us? According to the scriptures in Paul and Romans. They're there. You have nothing to fear from a policeman. If he's an honorable policeman, there are some bad ones. I think we know there's bad things in everything. But the police originally, when they want to serve the public, they're called public servants to protect us. And when you have problems that arise, you do what? You call for the police. But today, the police are being treated very ugly. They're being dishonored. They want to, people are calling for you know, defund them? Well, how can they do their job if they don't have finances? Doesn't make sense. But that's the, that's what's happening, folks. The law is being assailed. And even in the realm of religion, you remember what people tell you today in many church religions? You can't keep the law. The law is done away. Christ did away with the law. Oh, he did away with the law. You're telling me that Christ is a law breaker? He did away with his father's law? That does not make sense. It's not scriptural. But what we're seeing here, political leaders today as well, the wicked people, they're jumpy. You know why? They know they're guilty. They know they're guilty. That's what Proverbs 28 and verse 1. They're jumpy because of their guilt. They're, and we hear the old expression, there's no honor among thieves. That's why they turn on each other. Everything's expedient, situation ethics with them. Political leaders live in fear. They live in fear because everything that they do is based on being elected or re-elected. And so what do they have to do? They have to be willing to compromise or do whatever is necessary to get elected. And in so doing, the scriptures make it very clear that we have examples that politics depends on people willing to follow. And we have many people today who are willing to follow the wicked way that does away with law and order and everything decent. People want to live like Ecclesiastes says, if, if, a, if an evil work is not punished then, people cast off restraint. And today people are casting off restraint. They don't want discipline. They don't want to hear anything about it. Where is honor, loyalty, faithfulness, obedience? These are words people don't want to hear, and they don't want to hear the word sin. Why? They don't want them to believe this. No, there's no such thing as sin. What is sin? 1 John 3, 4. It is the violation of God's sacred law. A law that keeps everything organized in the right and proper way in a relationship with God and a relationship with our fellow human beings. Cast that out. What do you have? If you didn't follow laws on the highway, you would have chaos. You're already watching people drive with all kinds of chaos on the highway. But you have to be obedient and follow law or you've got chaos. So these political leaders are willing to do what? They're willing to compromise and do these things. In Matthew 14 and verse 5, this is Matthew 14 and verse 5, we have the story about Herod. And when you read that story, what you find out, it, what does it say? It said, Herod feared the crowd. He feared the crowd. He, he looked out there, you know, what are my constituents going to think? Well, you don't worry about what your people think. You're supposed, if you're a true representative, you're supposed to represent what the people have sent you there for. But people today don't do that. Today there's too much compromising on their horizon. And so we find what? The mob. We hear a lot of that. Now in the realm of crime, what do they call <laughs> the syndicate? They call it the mob. And what do they call Civilians, when they go crazy on the street, we call them the mob has taken over the streets. So it is, it is all 
coming together, as Jesus said, chaos and upheaval in this end time. And it is the third, the third trimester, which tells us what? Because of events that have happened, and you and I have lived through these events, we have seen changes come about. We've seen what's happened in the Middle East, how the nation of Israel was born. We've seen how Jerusalem came back to the hands of the Israelis. Why? Because Jesus is coming back to Jerusalem. That had to happen. And you and I have lived to see it happen. Are we aware of what's going on? These are things I think many of us are not because Satan is one of his devices. He wants us to be fearful. Boy, what, what's going to happen in the future? Hey, we're worried about this, worried about that. Look at all the people who are disappointed because they thought a certain man, if he got reelected, everything would be great. Now we got a whole new individual in there and it's not great. It's getting bad. And they're all despondent. They don't know what's going to happen because they're looking again, as I've mentioned to you before, please keep this in mind. There's three levels we must always ask ourselves. What is God doing on the God level? He's working on his plan and his purpose. What is going on in our human level? This is where you and I live. I found it interesting that even the term was used in the, I believe it was that series called the, the Lord of the Rings. And at one of the segments of it is called Middle Earth. And I thought, oh, where do they come up with that idea of Middle Earth? What is Middle Earth? Middle Earth is where you and I live. And where is the underworld that's where the fallen spirit world lives we have to know what's going on in their world we have to be observant as what's going on in our world but we must always understand it from the spiritual look to see what god says it does we hear this and they say well this is happening now oh, it's not important god looks down he says, that's very important take note of that and people don't take note of it and what is this what am i saying that's what the scripture is telling us in the book of Revelation, this prophecy for our end time three, the third trimester. It's saying, warn the churches, make the people of God aware of the fact that all the disruption like you've never seen is on its way because the deliverance is going to be needed for Jesus Christ to come back and save us from what they're going to unleash and if you and I know that based on the word of God, let me put something to you that I never thought of before. Do you think Satan knows that too? If this is his world, and he knows, it's something in the Bible says he knows his time is short. How does, how does he know that? He knows that because he understands he's going to be taken out of circulation when Jesus returns. This is very, very important material. We need to always remember these things. What about Jesus when it came to the Pharisees? He had to deal with these people. And you remember they came and they questioned him. And they asked this, about what authority do you do this? And Jesus was very wise. He said, he answered the question with a question. And he said, uh, I'll answer your question if you'll answer mine. And, okay, say on, what's, what is it? John the Baptist, was, was he from heaven or, or from earth? And immediately, if you read that story, what it says is that because the people standing around were all listening to hear what the answer was going to be, it says they feared the people. Why? If they answered wrong, the people would be upset with them. So they skirted the issue and said, we can't tell. So Jesus said, well, since that's the problem you have, he says, neither do I tell you by what authority I do what I do. Because they ain't going to believe it anyway. Jesus knew what he had to do. You and I have to know what we have to do, no matter what. No matter what. Because if we get raptured in fear, and I really do think that that has hurt many people in the churches of God, where all they, wherever they are. You know, we want common sense. And so again, we don't make issues over things like masks or anything of that nature. But a lot of people got caught in that. 
And then they begin to look at themselves if they're not careful. They think they're more, self, they're more righteous than the others who don't wear masks. God says, let everybody be fully persuaded in their own mind. They're all, you're all being judged individually, all of us. We love everybody, whether they got a mask, whether they don't have a mask. Doesn't make any difference. Not with God. He wants us to obey him. Not to get caught up in all these different little issues that can hang up people and hurt them spiritually. And that's what we have seen because there have been some people who are deathly afraid. Well, if you are deathly afraid, I don't have to even like that term because it could lead to death. Where is faith in all of this? We're not to tempt God. We're not to go out and we're not looking for something. But at the same time, we don't want to be fearful of it because if you do, you're going to stop living. And that's why they knew all these problems began to happen with people. They weren't able to contact and interface with their families and their loved ones. So we're still learning about this whole thing. I think COVID, personally, I think it's going to be around for a long time. I don't think they'll let this issue go. I think it's a control issue, personally. And they want to control. And people are ready to bust out. They just can't wait to just get busy and start living again. Well, Herod feared the people. The Pharisees feared the people. Proverbs 10 and verse 24, the things we fear often happen. In other words, it becomes a self, almost a prophecy fulfilled. You create your own prophecy. I like what Psalm 36, verse 1 through 4, it says, the wicked who should fear God they have no fear of God. Even Paul talked about that in the book of Romans. That this is the problem. They have no fear of God. We are all very vulnerable, dear brethren. We're living in a time where things can really get out of hand fast. David told his son, Solomon, he told him about the importance of being strong and of good courage. Like Joshua was told by God, be strong, be of good courage. Well, we all know how weak we are. We know that we're not strong of ourselves. So we have to be what? Strong in the power of God. Strong in the power of his word. How did God's own son defend himself against the attacks of Satan the devil in Matthew 4? We have that account. Every time Satan threw something at him, Christ was able to recognize he was not ignorant of Satan's tactics and what he was doing, and he did what? He countershot his whole attack and shot the gun right out from underneath him, so to speak, by doing what? Quoting scripture. Satan would just say this, and he says, this is what it says. Always go back to the word of God. Stand on the word of God, and you can't lose. Get off the word of God and you will stumble. So it's very important that we stay close to God and follow his instructions. And so David told Solomon, you make, be strong. You find that in 1 Chronicles 22 and verse 13. So what is God saying to us? Be strong. Be strong. You're on the right track. God is with you. We have the case of Hezekiah. Now, this is one of my favorite in the Bible. I'll tell you, these stories, just like we heard in the sermonette, if these things don't excite you, then what's lacking? I mean, what, you know, do you, what, what do you need to have to really get you stirred up? Because these things are dynamite. This is the story of Hezekiah and Sennacherib and the Assyrians. And they came all around and surrounded the city, and they sieged the city, and... They, chaunt, they, they, in essence, chided Hezekiah and said, in essence, look, all these other places, all these other cities we've conquered, these nations, they had their gods, their gods couldn't soon. Don't listen to Hezekiah. And so what happens? Hezekiah knew the right answer. He went to God. He says, God, do you hear what they're saying? Do you hear what they're doing? We need you to help us, please or otherwise they're going to take us down. And God answered and said he would do what? 
he would fight. Now here's the interesting part of this. This whole story is, is in two areas. You read about it in 2 Chronicles chapter 32, verses 4 through 8. And you also read in 2 Kings chapter 19, verse 35. Now in 2 Chronicles 32, as you read verses 7 and 8, you find out that the Assyrians thought they had a done deal. They thought they were going to take Jerusalem, the capital city. And what ended up happening? Well, verse 21 says there was one angel. But I'd like to join, ask you to join me in 2 Kings chapter 19, 35. 2 Kings 19, 35. What's so exciting about this is to watch how God deals with it. <clears throat> no, all the words of Rabshakeh, he, uh, speaking for the king of Assyria, trying to send reproaches to the living God. And then notice verse 35. This is 2 Kings 19, verse 35. And it came to pass that night, what came to pass? That the angel of the Lord, we're talking about one angel, one angel. And what did this one angel do? He went out and he smote in the camp of the Assyrians a hundred fourscore and five that's 185,000. One of God's powerful angels. When God sends an angel to come at your help, that angel has the power to wipe out 170, 185,000 men. That's a whole army of men. Just, just They never rise to see the sun the next day. They're all dead men. And it just says, And when they arose early in the morning, behold, they were all dead dead corpses. Now what does that tell us? That tells us that when problems come, and we don't know how all these problems are going to come, that's why I mentioned the sermon on the giants we may have to face in the future. None of us know some of this. We know the beginning, we know the end by God's decree, but we don't know the in-between sometimes. But God is giving us that information in this end time because we're heading for the third trimester. Keep that in mind. The ladies really have the answer to this question to us based on what Jesus was saying. And women can identify with that 100%. What does that mean? Baby's on the way. Why is it going to be necessary to understand this? Because if we aren't delivered as the people of God in the end time by Jesus Christ, like he delivered the Egyptians, no, the Israelites from the Egyptians who had them in bondage, that type is the antitype. It's teaching us again. When the time was right, God delivered through Moses a type of Christ. And now the literal Christ is going to have to come and develop us and protect us and deliver us in this end time. Why do we know that? Because Jesus said, if he did not cut this time short, there would be no flesh saved alive. We've got mad men today who have nuclear weapons, Iranians who said they're ready to go. They're all threatening to take Israel, the state of Israeli, off the face of the earth. We see all these events happening, earthquakes and things accelerating, accelerating more and more. The news people talk about it. They say, this is historic. We've never seen anything like it. People who have lived through things say, I've never seen any kind of flood like this before. And so on and on it goes. And the pains are getting more and more. So I wish I could tell you today that things are going to get a lot better. No, that things are going to get a lot worse for all of us. But the good news of the coming kingdom of God, that's what you and I have been training for. 
because we're going to have to help the survivors of this madness that has been created by mankind. Because this earth will not look like it's anything like you see it now. That's why Jesus has to come, it says, to regenerate the earth. If they start slinging nuclear weapons around like crazy, you saw with what the couple bombs did in Hiroshima and Nagasaki? Can you imagine North Korea, China, all these different ones throwing bombs back and forth? Like one man said one time, I don't care how many bombs you've got, one is quite enough. And that's true. One bomb is enough. You won't be there after that. So this again tells us, again, we are not to live in fear. This is a demonstration of that God comes to the aid of his people who cry out to him. God will take care, but there's one area that man really does fear most of all. And this is the weapon that Satan loves to use. It's the fear of death. People worry about what happens after death. Well, they have every reason to worry if they're not living right because they're going to be accountable for what they have lived, every action, every behavior. But what is now very clearly being demonstrated is the reason why Jesus Christ had to come to the earth. We find that given to us in the scriptures in the book of Hebrews, chapter 2 and verse 15. Let's take a look at that, Hebrews 2 and verse 15. And remember, Hebrews is the priestly book. It's designed to teach us what is going to be our responsibilities as kings and priests. So in Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 15. It says, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy. What needed to be destroyed? Destroyed him that had the power over death. That is the devil. Satan uses this as the ultimate weapon. And so what people do today is they live life worrying about the day they're going to die. And when you worry about that, you're wasting your time. God wants you to live your life while you've got your life. And he wants you to live it and enjoy it as a gift from him. Christ had to disarm Satan with his weapon of stealth. And that weapon of stealth was the fear of death. So through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we don't have to fear. That's why Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Christ had not yet come, but notice the attitude those fellows had. When they were put against the wall, and it could have been intimidating, and it's fearful. You stand before the power that is, and he looks at you and he says, nothing can keep you away from my power. <clears throat> and if you don't do what I tell you to do, bow when I hear it, say bow. Well, they knew they couldn't because the second commandment says you can't bow to anything other than to God. So they knew that would be a violation. That would be idolatry and breaking of the commandments. Break one, you break them all. But the answer, boy, you talk about an answer of faith. And why did God record it? For some of the people who are going to have to face that challenge somewhere in the future. I don't know who that is. None of us do. That's for God to determine. But what he did, he gave us an example. If you find yourself in that situation, all you have to do is remember. Do not fear. Merely say, our God, who is able to deliver us from whatever you're being faced with, he's able to deliver us. But even if he doesn't, we will not bow to your false God. There's going to be a lot of false gods out there. I just found out of one the other day that scared the daylights out of me. Because when I listened to what he said and what came flowing out of his mouth, it absolutely made me have chills. For he said, in essence, he was the one who is incarnate as the Christ. 
lying wonders, false prophets. And the people who were listening to him stood up and cheered. Are we living in dangerous times, dear brethren? Yes. Please remember, we're told in Ecclesiastes 8, verses 12 through 13, let's hear the conclusion of the matter. What are we supposed to learn about all of this? Fear God and keep his commandments. This is the whole man, the whole woman. And coupled with that, in Psalm 34, verses 4 through 7, you will read, it says that God does what? In verse 1, we are delivered from all our fears. Fear God, keep his commandments. That's what you and I have been called to do. And keep our eyes riveted on the kingdom of God. Why? Because it's the third trimester, dear brethren. I could be totally wrong. I, 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 I just, I'm just telling you what I see. What do you see? You want to see something different? Feel free to do so. What I see tells me when I hear people say, if we don't get everything together within the next 12 years, we're all going to die with climate change. What do you see? And who else sees that and knows that his time is short? God be with you. God bless you all.